Hello, welcome to the Monday, January 7th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The DA came across some Windows malware that was distributed as a tar file. Tar files are very common for Unix users. It's well the tape archive file format, but less common in Windows. And Windows itself actually can't usually open tar files. You need additional software, but WinZip, which uh, most users install on Windows, is able to open tar files. And as Didier points out, uh, there are a couple of reasons why an attacker may select to send a tar file. First of all, well, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, it's not that uncommon that users actually have software like WinZip to open tar files. And secondly, tar files may not be inspected by anti-malware. And even if they are inspected, that standard signatures may not necessarily find the malware. Did he also pointed out another trick that specifically applies to tar files? And that's in Windows. If you download a file normally over the internet, some metadata is added as an alternative data stream that labels the file as downloaded from the internet. And if you try to execute it, it will pop up a warning if it's an executable. Well, the tar file is labeled as such, but you can open the tar file without seeing a warning because you're not executing anything. And then if you extract the executable inside this tar file, this metadata, this alternate data stream is not transferred to the file. So now you can execute the file without any warning. And that may be why they're doing this, why they're using tar files. Yes, they may lose some victims that are not able to open the files. But on the other hand, they may gain more by actually not displaying this warning. Patrick Waddle came out uh, with yet another free security tool for Mac OS. Now, this tool, Reiki, I think that's how you pronounce it, is able to detect some keystroke loggers. Keystroke loggers use persistent keyboard event tabs in order to watch the user's keystrokes. These tabs logically kind of work like a network tab and Reiki will alert the user if it detects a new event tab. And will also show which program did set up that event tab. And that's sort of a little bit the tricky part here. It's not just malicious software that is using event tabs or keyboard event tabs. Some normal software also does that I believe Siri, for example, does it in order to detect the activation key sequence that you can define in macOS that uh, springs Siri into action. So yes, you will, for example, see a pop up that Siri sets up one of these event tabs. And of course, the next step would be that that hacker just names their software to something that you expect to set up one of these event tabs. Well, uh, Patrick is working on a newer version of this. Currently, it's just in beta, if I got it right. And the newer version will allow you to whitelist certain software or also whitelist everything that's, for example, signed with an official Apple certificate. So not just an Apple developer certificate, but something that's actually a genuine piece of Apple software. And then just a quick add-on follow-up uh, to a tool I mentioned last week. I talked about Uncaptcha 2. This tool is pretty good in breaking the latest version of the Google Recaptcha captures. These are all these fancy images that you see that you have to click on in order to make it past the I'm not a robot check. And now, what they're actually doing, and I didn't mention that last week, didn't know about this, is that as in the past, they're not really bothering with the images. They're looking at the audio file that's delivered for people with visual problems. Now, the way they're cracking this, and uh, I think uh, someone else did this last year, is they're actually feeding the audio file to Google's speech to text engine. So essentially, they have Google break its own captchas and works pretty well, even though they have to do some preparation before they're actually sending the audio file to Google. 
And Proofpoint came across an interesting phishing toolkit that makes it more difficult to detect phishing sites. Now, a lot of automated tools that hunt for phishing sites, they look for keywords like trademarks on random websites not associated with a particular company. This phishing kit bypasses these detection tools by using a custom font. Now, typically, of course, the font wouldn't matter uh, because the text in HTML is just ASCII, but what they're doing here is that they're they're actually swapping letters in the font. So the letter A looks like B, the letter B looks like A and uh, and so on. So with that, uh, the user thinks that they're reading A, B, but actually the ASCII code is B, A. So it's a simple substitution cipher they're implementing here by loading a custom font. Actually pretty ingenious idea because now these automated tools have no idea what's going on. And of course for them, it's not easy uh, to undo this uh, substitution cipher, even though it's not a strong cipher. It's really more sort of an obfuscation. And, and to the user, the page looks perfectly normal. And of course, they're falling for the fish. This can also be a problem if, uh, for example, users are reporting phishing sites, because a lot of larger companies, of course, they receive a lot of these phishing reports, and they typically have some automated tools verifying these reports and triaging them. And of course, these automated tools, they may then fall for this trick and consider a particular page as non-malicious. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.